What is creative interviewing? Well, I'm going to start off talking about what are creative interviews and then ask various other sort of questions to try to give you a sense of a, an overview and a flavour, really, of, of, uh, of, of what this, this form of interviewing is. So it's going to be a bit of a dash through rather than an in-depth look at these things because I, I want to give you quite a broad overview. OK, so to start with, I think um, creative interviews are... Uh, a kind of they're based on a communicative communicative exchange they're based on an interaction um, rather than a heavy a heavy sort of question and answer style so if you're used to a kind of questionnaire format where you would ask a, a series of questions in, in in a very straightforward way and expect answers to those questions it's rather different from that and I've always liked the the way Bob Burgess put it, that, the, that quali well, he was talking about semi-structured qualitative interviews, which is essentially a, 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 the same or a similar kind of thing. Um, and he calls them conversations with a purpose. And I think that's, that's how they feel. They feel if you're being interviewed in this kind of way, it feels more like a conversation than being fired questions at one after the, one after the other. So it's an informal um, and conversational style. So, you know, you, you don't... You, don't, you wouldn't normally expect to have a clipboard or indeed a laptop to record the, the answers, as it were. Um, you, don't, you wouldn't expect to be ticking boxes as you might in a questionnaire and so on. Um, and it's not just about questions and answers. It's, it's, about, it's about an interaction and an exchange which is, which is going on. Um, another aspect that I think is a, a kind of defining feature, I suppose, is that um, these kind of interviews are tailored and customised um, to the person or people who are being interviewed. Um, they're often thematic, so they're often based around a set of themes that the interviewer wants to wants to follow up. Um, but the point is that they're not they're not fully scripted. So if you're doing this sort of interview, you're very unlikely to have a piece of paper or whatever that has the full script of all the questions written one by one in a, in a sequence, um, a numbered sequence. Um, it's much more likely that you'll have a list of topics and themes that you want to cover. You might have, you might have jotted down some, some possible ways of asking these kinds of questions, but it's much more important, as you can imagine in a conversation, that you listen to what the person has said and then ask them something that follows that up in the kind of wording that fits the encounter, that fits the interaction, rather than saying, OK, thank you, and now I'm going to read you question eight, which is whatever, you know. So, it, the, the, so, so they're usually tailored to the person, customised, and you follow up the, the kinds of themes that seem relevant in that encounter. So you may be uh, following up different uh, questions with different people or groups that you interview, you don't necessarily ask everybody exactly the same thing. So they're not standardised. Um, uh, they also may involve, and usually would involve, um, observation and exploration of uh, not only verbal dimensions of the encounter or interaction, but also non-verbal ones as well. So you might well be interested in the sort of materiality of the situation. Um, you might be interested in, in spatial aspects of it, where things are in whatever the location is that you're, that, where you're doing the interview and so on, environmental aspects, uh, non-human aspects. Some people are interested in, for example, animals or the natural world and how that's kind of intersecting with whatever it is that you're, uh, you're interviewing people about. Um, Embodiment, again, people may often be interested in how, um, uh, how the encounter is embodied, how it involves people's bodies, literally, physica you know, physicality. Uh, sentient aspects, so what people are thinking, and also sensory aspects, so um, the visual and audit auditory and tactile and olfactory, you know, the things that are to do with, to do with, to do with the senses. Um, all of, the, all of these kinds of things, you may not be interested in every one of them, but <laughs> creative interviews are, you know, may involve these sorts of things. These kind of interviews may involve doing more than talk. So again, it, it depends what you expect an interview to be, but if you expect it to be something where there's an interviewer with a schedule of questions and you talk and you get the answers through talk, 
Well, these forms of interviews may involve more than that. Now, clearly, I've already talked about sort of non-verbal aspects, but they may have quite an ethnographic style um, where, where uh, the, the researcher is, is, is interested in the whole dynamics of the situation, I guess. Um, they may involve doing things, making things. Um, so, for example, in, in interviews that I've done in this kind of way, we've sometimes... Um, uh, uh, drawn family trees with the people we're interviewing. Um, I know some people uh, who have used sort of arts-based kind of methods, so you might actually draw some pictures or make, it could even model something or sculpt something, or um, there are, uh, or you can, um, you can try to work with people to show, for example, if you want their life story, you might ask them to uh, build that in certain ways using different materials. I mean, researchers have used things like Lego, um, or you know, or you can you can you can put sort of uh, creative arts type materials on the table or or in in front of the person or the people and get them to build something. Um, they might involve um, often do involve taking uh, pictures. So they might involve taking photographs. Um, as one project that I was involved in, for example, we, we gave people cameras um, and asked them to take pictures which were relevant to our, our research topic. Um, and then we, these were disposable cameras, and then we got the films developed and brought them back and had an interview with the people, which was based partly around looking at those pictures and talking about them and understanding their, their role and so on. And similarly, they can involve um, video. So you might video an interview, or in an interview, you might talk about some video that, that has been shot already or whatever. So sort of creative in those kinds of ways. And once you start thinking in that kind of way, there are sort of almost endless possibilities which you, you, you might need to rein your enthusiasm in a bit, actually, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, they may be conducted in and through a range of locations. So, again, if your view of an interview is that you sit in two chairs opposite, you know, an interviewer and an interviewee, asking questions and getting answers, well, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, it can be. You can be staying still. You can be in a whole range of different locations to do that, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a sort of sanitised clinical location. So you might want to actually interview people in their place of work or something like that, or out in the street. Um, there's quite a lot of um, work now on um, uh, mobile interviews. So uh, the idea that you can do interviews while walking um, or, or while in the car or travelling with people on buses or whatever. Um, and there's some real value in that, actually, because you may have noticed in your own lives that actually sometimes... Um, interaction is easier if you're not sitting face to face with someone having eye contact with them where it can sometimes feel very intense and so on whereas actually if, if you're walking somewhere it's sometimes easier to have, uh, to have a conversation but also um, if you're interested in um, uh, localities for example and place and people's interaction with locality and place then it can be a very good idea to actually interview them whilst travelling through the place that you're interested in. It's very, it contextualises it. Um, they can point things out to you. Um, you can make observations of non-verbal elements, environment, element, environmental elements, and, and, and so on. Uh, and creative interviews, as indeed any interviews, may involve you know, one interviewee, an interviewer, or several. So we don't have to assume that it's the one-on-one -on -one kind of encounter. Okay, so that's sort of what I'm thinking of when I talk about creative interviews. So why creative? Why am I calling them creative? Well, they, they can involve observation and exploration, as I've said, of verbal and nonverbal dimensions. And I think there's something um, creative about that, about thinking beyond the verbal and beyond talk, I suppose. But they encourage um, creative thought about um, what counters data as well and what interviews uh, can and can't do. Um, so I think um, as well as all, all, of those, all of those things about how they can involve these um, you know, creative elements in, an, in themselves, they also encourage us as researchers to think quite creatively about which elements of this actually counters data. Um, because we all too easily, I think, just assume that it's the answers to the questions that people gave, um, rather than thinking a little bit more broadly about what, what counts as data. 
Um, so they encourage critical thought about creative interviewing activity that, that goes beyond the dialogue. Okay. So what are they for and when would you use them? Um, and what kind of data and knowledge can they produce? Well, the kinds of uh, understandings you can get from, quali uh, from uh, well, qualitative and creative interviews are, are interpretive understandings, I think. So you're probably familiar with these ideas, but that it, with this, this kind of interviewing, you, might, you may get rather rich data about processes, about nuances. So um, instead of getting a very sort of simple answer, that you know, this is how it is. You may you may get more um, nuanced data about the complexities, and this is how it looks if you look from this perspective. But from this perspective, it maybe is slightly different, or um, you know, people experience these things in different ways, and so on. So it's it it, it it's sort of moving beyond the straightforward, I suppose. Um, they can give you data about meanings. So what what you know, social processes or social actions or behaviours mean. Um, and what meanings people attribute to them. So it gives you a good opportunity to ask people what they think these things mean in their own lives. Again, whatever it is that you're talking about. Um, they can give you good access to people's um, experiences. and uh, uh, So people can tell you about their experiences. But also, as I've said, something like a walking interview. If you're interested in people's ex you know, local experiences, if you actually walk through or move through a locality with people, as well as them telling you about them, you can, they, they can show you, you can see how these things work in practice on the ground, I suppose. Uh, so you get data about these things, you get, you, you get, you, you can get quite deep data about the dynamics of social situations, um, you know, quite a dynamic more than a static picture, because because of the depth and the complexity of the, of the uh, knowledge and information you can get. You can get um, understanding of how different aspects of the social world are connected up, in, in, often in, in people's lives, um, and the complexities of that process. So again, I, but I guess compared to a method that might sort of um, uh, disaggregate um, people's experiences um, a, 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 and get them into small little... Um, containable units that you could use to make big comparisons. Uh, this is more saying, well, how do these things connect in, pe in people's experiences or in a social situation or whatever? So people often say that they're good at answering the why and how questions um, about social life that we might be asking. Um, I think they also give quite nuanced understandings of the what questions, because sometimes we think that this kind of method is good at why and how, but if we want to know what's going on, we maybe need a different kind of method. Well, <laughs> actually, sometimes the what is quite complex as well, so I guess that, um, that what I wanted to say is the, the, this kind of method can also give you quite a close and, and uh, subtle understanding of what's happening. Um, I put real life resonance here because um, they're, they're methods w that, that are, are, tend to be grounded in and sort of value what people say or show you or what you can observe about how things are in real life. I put this in quotes because it you know, depends what we mean by real life. But there's a kind of, um, uh, they can produce data which isn't so sanitized, I suppose, or so abstracted from real life that it somehow feels a bit empty so they can so so uh, they can produce uh, data that somehow that can resonate quite deeply with with real life um, that, that you would use these kinds of methods if you're interested in actors perspectives I put actors that's a kind of particular kind of terminology but if you're if, if you're interested in in people and their perspectives and their experiences and also if you're interested in how um, if, if, if you have a, a, a theoretical position, I suppose, that thinks that, uh, that, that, that suggests that, um, that these things are situational, so that it's not the case that you might, for example, be able to establish what people's views or attitudes are on something in the abstract, but that you might say, well, people don't really have those abstract views. Actually, views and attitudes are always grounded in some kind of situational context. So if, you, if, if that's your view, then this is, the kind of, this is the kind of method you might use because you would, try to be, you would be using your interviews to try to situate um, this kind of, the, the kind of knowledge that you were, you were gleaning. So knowledge is situated and contextual rather than abstract or universal. 
Um, and the idea that knowledge is constructed and created, not simply con collected. I think this is quite important. Um, and different, different people with different kind of theoretical backgrounds have a different take on this question. But I think mostly if you're using these sorts of methods, you, you're tending to think that it's not the case that you can just get a finely tuned instrument and then go and gather facts about the social world. It's much more that you think that actually knowledge is, is constructed and created through engagement with the social world and engagement with, with, with people in interviews, for example. And that actually you would, get, you would derive data from interviews, but that you would need to do something with that, something interpretive with that, in, a, in order to turn it into knowledge. So it's not just the case that you would get your data from your interviews and count it up and then say, right, well, there's so many like this and so many like that. There's more to do to turn it into knowledge. There's the, the construction and creation of, of knowledge from, 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 that, from the data. Um, they also, they give you uh, knowledge of the particular in some depth. So the, the, they're methods which are aimed at looking at the particular, really. And then um, generalization, which may or may not be something you want to talk about in questions afterwards, but the idea is that generalization, generalizations that you would make from this kind of uh, data would be achieved through understanding processes in the round, in the particular, how it works in that particular situation. And you would be arguing, look, I can show you the detail of how this works. I can show you how these things connect and impact upon each other and so on. Rather than a, a logic which says, well, I had, a, I had a representative sample, I collected standardized data from them, therefore I generalize on that basis. So it's a, a different kind of logic to that. Okay, how do you decide who to interview and where and when? So I'm trying to engage quite practically here with how you might sort of put this to use. Um, these are big questions and there isn't one answer of course um, I think what you need to do is think about your data so think about the data sources that, that, that your um, that your method that this method implies that you're using so you're thinking about um, the kind of perspectives you can you can gain access to the kind of interactions you might be able to observe the kind of situations you might be able to be part of um, and the kind of knowledge that you can therefore uh, glean from those. And you'll think, well, you know, which, which perspectives are relevant for my research? So you'll all have your own research questions, and, you, you know, you, you need to think through what the answer, for that is, answer to that is. But, but which perspectives? Who do you need to talk to? Who can give you a perspective that's relevant to your research question that will help you answer your research question? Or who has that knowledge? The, the, the knowledge that you need and again these sound terribly obvious questions but they're, they're, they're not actually we tend to forget we tend to think well if we just get a sample of people that'll be all right <laughs> you know and they'll they'll be able to give us some some information through these interviews but you need to think well you know who has the who has the right kind of perspective so for example I, I've been involved in quite a lot of research on kinship and one of the things that that we've um, done in various studies is worked out ways to weave in different perspectives. Um, so we've done interviews um, with, for example, children and then with parents, um, thinking about different perspectives on, in that case, on how children work out their kin relationships and how they make sense of those kin relationships. Um, or we've done uh, studies which are, are looking at a wider range of kin and looking at the different kinds of perspectives they can offer on the kinds of things that we're interested in. So it, it involves thinking about those kinds of things for you. Again, rather than thinking what I need to do is get a sample which is representative in terms of certain demographic characteristics. It, of course, you're interested in demographic characteristics as well, but in terms of thinking about who you're going to interview, you need to think, well, what would they potentially have to tell me that would be relevant to my research questions? Um, okay. And also, you're, you're more likely to be using a kind of theoretical or purposive kind of sampling or selection um, than, as I've said, random or statistical sampling. Um, and this is... This is I, I'm not... This isn't a session on sampling, so I'm not going to say lots about this. Um, but that's not least because you, you won't be genera generating standardised data. 
from sort of individual sampling units. Again, it, again in my research on kinship, I mean, some of the, the units, if you'd like to think of it in that way, that were important were sometimes individuals, but they were sometimes kin groups, like whole groups of relatives. But there isn't um, an objective way, or not a very satisfactory one, to define what is a group of relatives, because it depends who you ask. So if I, I ask any of you, who, who do you count as your relatives? If I then asked your brother or your daughter, you would get a different group of people, if you see what I mean. So there isn't an objective, sort of always an objective kind of sampling unit or group. Um, and you're not always sampling similar kinds of units. It's not always as though you're sampling in, in a sort of standardised way. Um, so even if you wanted to use a kind of more random or statistical sampling method, it's actually not, it's, it's, it's often not possible anyway to put that into practice because the kinds of things you're looking at simply won't fit into those sort of nice standardised kind of, kind of units. But there, there's lots of other logic for using a more theoretical and purposive sampling kind of uh, techniques as, as well, which are more to do with the ways in which you think you can derive knowledge and understanding from, from these sorts of interviews. Okay, so how do you prepare for and conduct uh, creative interviews? Um, well, quite a lot of this is about asking questions. And the key message, which I've already said, and I'll say again now, and I may say again before the end, um, is when you're thinking about preparing to do these kinds of interviews, don't, please don't, produce a, number, a, a script of questions that are numbered in a tightly structured sequence even if you're thinking, well, I know I'm doing that, but that's not how I'm going to ask the questions, but I'm just doing that because it's organised. The thing is, if you go into an interview with a script of numbered questions, that's what you'll do. You'll ask them in that kind of way, and you'll end up doing a kind of much more structured questionnaire-type type interview, survey-style survey interview. So the best thing is don't produce that in the first place, and then you won't be able to go and do that. Because if you do that, then you end up losing all of the richness and, and complexity and so on that you planned to have if you were planning to do these kind of interviews. So that's my key message. But then here's some other ideas. Well, first of all, there's the difference between research questions and interview questions. And I think it's important that you, um, that in any research actually, but certainly for doing these kinds of interviews, that you have a sense of what the, your big research question is, what it is you really want to know. So a research question obviously is what you want to know. It's not necessarily what you're going to ask people in an interview. It's more the intellectual question that's driving your research. So you may have a big question, you may have mini questions as well. There might be an overarching question and then there are smaller things that, you, that are components of that, um, which are or instances, as I've got here, of, of the big thing, as it were. Now, I think you need to be clear about what those are so that you can then develop um, topics, themes and areas and dimensions that you intend to cover somehow in your <coughs> interviews. So you need to think, OK, well, if I'm really interested in um, a study that I did, uh, inheritance in kin, in, kin relation, in kin relations and how it works, how inheritance works, therefore I might want to have certain topics. So I might want to ask people about making a will and if they've ever made a will, or I might want to ask them if they've ever, ever inherited anything. Um, or, or whatever. So it's a kind of, you know, a broad thing that you think, well, I think if I cover that, I'll get something about the thing that I'm interested in. So I think somewhere or another, I want to cover that in my, in my interview. Um, then, you, then you need to think about different kind of ways of covering these sorts of, of topics, because there's a whole range of different ways, um, obviously, to approach any, any topic. Um, and I think the key thing, again, is you, it, it's it's okay to think of some sample questions that you might ask people, but don't take them in as a script with you. Better to think about, well, you know, what kinds of uh, practical questions could I could I ask? What sorts of things might I get people talking about um, that would that would, would would mean I would cover these kinds of kinds of issues? And, and often you'll want to start off asking people things, but then they will start talking. And then your next question is going to come from what they've said. You're going to follow it up. Again, as I said at the beginning, rather than the next question on your script. Because you listen to what they say and you'll think, actually, I think this, that's quite relevant. That's relevant to something I'm interested in. I'm going to follow that up. 
Um, so you, you just need ways to get people to start talking about the kinds of things that you're interested in, I suppose. And also, I've got practical creative activities. So if you want to do something like a family tree or get people to take pictures or, or, or whatever, or build something out of Lego or Play-Doh. Or, um, but I've also put here, think about what kinds of data these will yield. Um, because it's very easy to think of all sorts of exciting ways to generate all kinds of data. And then you sometimes get the data and you think, I, I don't, I'm not quite sure what this means or where this is going to take me. So you need to think through with all of these things, these ways of covering your topics. Think, well, would that generate data or knowledge that is going to be useful for those research questions that I'm interested in? You also need to factor in an openness to things you hadn't thought of and ways of seeing and interpreting that you hadn't predicted. And this is, this is something, of course, you can do when you don't have a tight structure. So you can allow yourself, and again, this comes from listening often, listen to what people are saying when you're interviewing them. And that might, you might think, do you know, I'd never thought of that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow this up in this particular way. I want to ask this. Um, so be ready to hear things that are slightly outside of your preconceptions. You want them to be on topic, so you'll want them to be relevant to that thing at the top, that big research question or those many research questions that you're interested in. But you'll want to be able to hear things that you hadn't thought of necessarily and follow them up. Um, you need to match all of these things with your own epistemological and ontological assumptions. So your own epistemological, meaning your own ideas about how it's possible to generate knowledge of, of, uh, of, of whatever you're interested in. And your ontological assumptions. I mean, every, people in this room will have very different ontological assumptions about what the social world is made up of. You know, some of you will see it as made up of discourses. Some of you will see it as made up of behaviours, some of practices some of institutions, do you see what I mean? Those are these different kinds of um, uh, uh, levels or understandings of what the, what the world is. Um, and you need to be thinking about how, whether and how your, your questions are going to generate data that reflects back on, on, on that kind of ontology that, that, you've, uh, that you've begun with. And all, yeah, everyone will tell you this, but the importance of piloting to assess whether the interviews are producing the kind of data and knowledge that does address your research questions. Because we always assume if we ask people questions, they answer those questions. And of course, they don't necessarily. They, could, they can sometimes tell you something else. And so you need to check whether this is working, whether you're getting what you need. OK, continuing with how you prepare for and conduct um, interviews. These are just some tips, really, for asking questions. So you'll gather that I'm saying don't just, don't just compose a questionnaire because that you, you lose all the benefits of a creative interview. But it is a good idea to work out and try out an introductory or starter question because um, you don't necessarily always use the same question with everybody when you start um, because sometimes people will start talking to you before you've asked your first question and they start talking about something that you know you want to follow up so you just go with it whereas other times you know you'll, you'll say okay right what I'd like to talk to you about today is you know so it doesn't always work in the same way but thinking about your introductory question and trying one out because I've noticed uh, in my years of experience that we tend to put too much into an introductory question sometimes. So sometimes you'll try and tell them all the complexity about what your study is about in that first question and then leave it as a rather open-ended, you know, question. And then people think, I don't know what you want, you know, and so then they may start to give you their whole life story, which actually isn't quite what you wanted. And it, it, it gives you a lot to deal with that, that's, that can be quite difficult at the beginning of an interview. So an introductory question is quite a good idea. Um, this applies to surveys and every way of asking questions. Try not to ask too many questions at once because people will struggle to answer. And again, I've noticed people often do that in their first question because they've got it all in their head and they're thinking, oh, there's so much I want to know. So they ask three things at once. And then um, the person... Um, it's not so much that you don't know which question they're answering, which would be a problem with a survey if you, if you ask three things and then you didn't know which bit they'd responded to. Because that normally comes out in the wash as they talk and you, you work out what they're answering. It's more that you'll just, they'll just think, I've, I haven't a clue how to answer that question and it won't help with the rapport of the situation. Avoid asking people to generalise unless you're sure that that's useful. So 
um, it's better, this is my view, it's better usually to ask people, given what, what creative interviews are good at, which is at getting at experience and nuance and meanings and so on, it's better to ask people about how those work in their lives. Ask them about some kind of experience that they've had um, than to say to them, well, do you usually think, do you, do you think that people mostly... Um, leave their property to their sons rather than their daughters or something with my inheritance example. Well, first of all, they might not know, but also um, asking them to generalise, especially at an early point in an interview, can sometimes be problematic because it's hard to get them back to talking about the, the detail and the grounded nature of their own experience. So be careful about that. Don't plunge straight into questions that ask people to analyse or evaluate some things. You know, sometimes we sometimes we ask quite challenging questions of our interviewees. We might say something like, "How do you think attitudes have changed to whatever you're interested in over the years?" And they probably think, oh, "Well, couldn't I, you know, I don't." It, that's hard to answer. It's quite hard to sort of analyse and evaluate. Um, or asking people things like, uh, "Who's your best friend?" Um, or "Have you got a best friend?" Or "How many best friends have you?" And you know, you're getting people to think, "I don't." I, best friend right okay uh, you know um and that can be hard it, it's not that these questions are never valuable but they can close people down because they they start making them talk in abstractions rather than necessarily talking about their experience so it might be better to say can we talk about you know some of your friends and let's and and, and talk about different friends one by one or something like that rather than asking them to evaluate which one's best or, or whatever Similarly with asking why too soon in the proceedings. And sometimes asking why, you may not want to ask why at all, actually, um, because people tend to give you their theories of why certain things are happening and going on. But if you ask why, you're pushing them to sometimes uh, simplify uh, or make a judgment that they might never have thought of before. They might never have done that. And they might just think, I don't know, OK, I'll say this and just sort of say it. Um, and, and that, that maybe doesn't give you the deep kind of data that you thought you might be getting. Uh, it's a very good idea to develop a stock of questions that will ha help you get the context and elaboration that you do want. So actually, I've always found, instead of asking why, asking something like, that's interesting, how did that come about? Or how did that develop? Or do you know, you know, and sometimes it might be, do you know, because they may feel they don't know. But asking something which um, allows people to open up and tell you about the processes that you're interested in rather than saying, why do you think that was, you know, which they may, may find harder. Um, uh, oh, so open questions, or those asking for a story or biography, can produce very long and daunting mm -hmm. answers. They can be very good, but they can be very hard for you to follow up in an interview situation. So if you're going to ask those sorts of questions, be ready and think, well, how will I follow that up? Because, again, I've sometimes seen someone ask something about, well, can you tell me your life story? And then someone does, and they put a lot of effort into it. And then they get to the end, and then the person, the interviewer, doesn't quite know what to do with that. And they say, right, thanks. I'll move on and ask something else. And it sort of looks like you're disinterested if you, you know, if you've... So you need to think, okay, what will I do with it if someone gives me all of this kind of data? I need to work out how to follow that up. And the key thing, always... Um, is to listen to what people are saying and what they don't say and what they imply and picking up threads in what they say. I'm assuming talk here, but this, the same applies with different forms of activity. Picking up threads that relate to your research questions for you to ask about next. And so when you're doing this kind of interview, because you haven't got a script in front of you, you have to have a way of remembering when they someone will give you an answer to a question it might be a very long answer and they'll say three or four things that you know you want to follow up at some point but you have to log them you can write them down log it in your head or whatever so that you can come back to it so you first you might come back to it when they finish that their answer you might say that's interesting i'd like to pursue one of the things that you said there can i ask you more about that it might be later on in the interview you'll say earlier on you mentioned this and i was really interested in that can we talk a bit more about that so um, that's very important it's important to the experience of the interview for the uh, for the other person okay how do you prepare for and conduct them carrying on how getting people to do creative things I just wanted to say a few things about this if you're going to get people to draw pictures or make things out of play-doh and so on 
it's, it can be great fun thinking about these sorts of things you can do. But think about, will they want to do it? Will they be embarrassed in doing it? So just giving people cameras and asking them to take pictures immediately makes people think, I'm no good at taking pictures. I can't do that. Or if you want people to draw something because you're really interested in the way they might the way in which a drawing might express how they're thinking through these things will again think that they might be mortified if you ask them to draw because they haven't drawn a picture for you know 10 years and they're just really embarrassed about it so you know think about those things think about how you're going to focus so we, i've used various things like this in interviews and some and they may take off so we did um something with children where we were interested in the area that they lived and we had all these um like little model houses and schools and trees and things like that and we were and we were interested in their relationships and we asked them to sort of put you know put them on this um on this piece of paper and map it out and they could draw bits and put things on and the, the kids loved it actually they had they, I think they had a great time but it took ages and we got about that we didn't get much in terms of what we were really interested in we got lots of stuff you might use for a different project but not for ours so we used those at pilot stage and then we didn't we didn't carry on with those so think about the focus and how relevant it's all going to be think about what you want from these things and what they might give and try them out um so think about how much time they take rel relative to the value. Also thinking about how you see into and out of them. So it's, it's sometimes quite, if you've been talking, you know, uh, and then you're going to say, right, let's do this stuff with Play-Doh. And then you want to stop and move on to something else. Again, that can be the logistics of doing that um, can sometimes be uh, quite challenging. So you need to think about how, how you'll do that, how you'll move into and out of these phases. If you're doing interviews with photographs, which again we've done lots of in our research, um, if you if you only want the photographs to be a small part of it, if you want to look at people's family albums or something and talk to them about them, um, that it, that can be a problem because once they've got them all out, if you think, okay, that's good, we've done that, I want to move on to something else, well, people might want to keep coming back to them and say, oh, I think I can just find you a picture on that and spend ages looking for one and, and all of this kind of thing. Um, so think about you know how you're going to manage all of that. Think about how you're going to analyse those those forms of data, um, and in general, be aware of the sort of allure of glitzy and novel techniques just for the sake of it. So you can get carried away and think, well, this is this is good fun, but it doesn't get you too far. Okay, that's um, just that's a chart which um, sort of pictorially explains some of the stages that I've that I've just talked through. I'm not going to pause on that because of of time and if you want to this will be on the website afterwards so you can look at that afterwards so thinking about how you create data from these kinds of interviews and how you deal with the data well I said this earlier but at the stage when you're thinking right how am I going to you know what what is date what's what 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 is the data that's come from this well think again think creatively about this so the interaction that was going on the talk, but also other sounds and noises might be relevant to you uh, and your research. So the silences, what's not said and what you think is going on there, um, you, you're, you should, you will be, I imagine, producing field notes if you use this method where you're writing down what you think is going on and so on and so forth. So that's a resource that you can use as data. There may be all kinds of non-verbal elements that you're wanting to record and observe in some way or another. There may be pictures that have been produced or talked about um, or diagrams or things created. Um, so you, you need to think about, well, are they data and how do I tie them in with the, the rest of the data? Um, and, and visuals, uh, you might be your visual observations of what was going on. Audio, and people often um, record these kinds of interviews. Um, so that so that they can produce often it's so they can produce transcripts of them, but actually the audio, the sound, um, the, the the sounds themselves uh, may be relevant, and the text as transcripts. So all of these things and more could be could be data, but you need to think about that if you're analysing this the material from these interviews, you need to think about well are these data in my case and how do I handle them, and how do they reflect on the thing that you're interested in? What's their capacity as data in relation to your research questions? And therefore, how do you need to handle them? And you need to develop systems for storing these different forms of data so that you can retrieve them when you want around the kind of themes and issues that you want and so that you can assemble them. So a lot of writing, and I'll say a tiny bit in a minute about that, writing and presenting from these, this form of uh, method 
uh, involves assembling different kinds of data and weaving it together somehow. So you need to think about systems that will allow you to pull out the bits that you want to assemble them. So people often have manual indexing systems or they can use CACDAS, which is um, the acronym for Computer Assisted Qualitative Data Analysis Software, of which there are a range of types. So people may have heard of Envivo or Atlas or whatever. Um, so those can help you with uh, indexing and retrieval. Um, you may also be wanting to prepare case study files um, which pull together different forms of data around a case or a narrative or a more sort of ethnographic kind of uh, view. Um, these I haven't got time for really, but I just wanted to make sure we had these on. How do you analyse and interpret data from creative interviews? Well, there's a range of ways, and here, is some of, here are some of them. Cross-sectional coding and indexing of data um, is one way where you, can, where you can index your data so that you have cross-sectional codes which pull together data from all of your different interviews and other data sources um, around key themes and allow you, once it's pulled together around this key theme, it allows you to immerse yourself in that theme and do further interpretive work on that theme. Um, and that's, it's easier with text-based data than with pictures and audio, but you can, you can do versions of it with, with those. It's important to note if you do that, that these things you're producing, these cross-sectional codes, aren't variables or typologies. That's not the kind of data you're working with. So what you're doing is pulling these together in a way so that you can do further interpretive work on them. Um, you can do, there are various forms of conversation, discourse or metaphor analysis where you closely examine the words and gestures used. You can do case study and narrative and ethnographic style of, of analyses where what you're interested in is the stories that you, that you see emerging from your data, the sort of whole stories, and you weave together different forms of data. You need to think critically about what the creative materials represent. If you've produced creative materials, as it were, from your interviews, think what they represent and what meaning you can uh, read from them and what you can't. And often, in, in, again, in work that I've done, we, we sometimes, where we've, we've, draw, we've drawn certain kinds of charts and diagrams with people, well, some, we do use those, but actually what's often of interest to us is the way in which they were produced. So often what we're wanting to analyse is the kind of interaction around the production of this thing, not just the thing in itself. So you, you're kind of looking at the, the, the whatever has been produced, but also looking at, at the interaction that sort of led to that. Um, you need to think about connecting the parts, so the textual, visual, auditory, and so on, things made, and that can be a challenge. Um, you need to think reflexively um, about uh, the ways in which uh, the data, the, the way the data were generated are part of the story, and you as researcher, or whoever was a researcher, is part of that too. So, you know, at the most basic level, you won't just be analysing answers to questions you'll look at what you said as well and how you interacted because what's going on is an interaction, not just a gathering of information. Uh, an importance of creativity and imagination in how you analyse and understand your data. Import it's important to follow analytical questions and themes through the data, so that's a very good way to analyse this form of data, to ask analytical questions of the data. Um, and it's also very important in all of this, in all of this process, to make sure that you're systematic and you make notes of what you've done and you leave almost an audit trail of how you've done this. Because you, what you don't want to do is to just think, oh, I'm just being creative. You know, huh, I'll just take the, you know, the, the most interesting example and I'll weave my whole analysis around that um, without actually thinking how systematically that is reflected in your data and so on. So you need to um, uh, be able to do that. Okay, writing and presenting. Um, well, the way in which we do this is to try to make a convincing argument, I think, weaving different data into your story and your, and, and your argument. So it's not quite the same as, for example, using a particular statistical technique or running a particular kind of test which shows the kind of strength and significance of your data. It's more like building a case. You imagine it almost in a court of law where you're building a case and using what evidence you can to make a convincing argument. Um, Always relate that to key aspects of your research design. So remember what it was you were asking in the first place. Very important to remember how you sampled, because as I said at the beginning, you're unlikely to be doing a random statistical kind of sample. 
So don't, don't forget that when you come to write it up. Don't write it as though this was a random statistical sample when it wasn't. So you need to think back to how you've, how you've done the research. You're always going to be situating your argument in a dialogue with existing theory and research. I think that's very important with kind of creative interview kind of material that you, 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 you are engaged with um, a, a, a dialogue with existing research. Um, it's very important to make clear the connection between the data you choose to include. So if you're going to take quotes from your interviews or, or selections of pictures and so on, um, to uh, make connections between the ones you choose and the ones you don't. So are you saying that this is typical of all of them? Are you saying this is completely different and that's why you picked it because it's a contrast with all the others and so on? So you, you know, because otherwise what you end up doing is cherry picking, is just picking the bits that suit your argument and that's absolutely not acceptable. So push yourself, why have you chosen that piece of data? Um, how does that fit with the anal analysis of all of the data? Um, and you can use non-conventional forms of dissemination, although the world has to catch up with this yet uh, in some ways. But you can have, for example, there are online journals where you can have, um, <coughs> you can have links to video clips. Um, you can certainly have pictures. You can sometimes have sound bites. So if you're interested in, if, what, if you're using uh, creative material that involves sound, um, that's, that's possible. So you can think about those kinds of things. Confidentiality and ethics, I'll leave because we'll run out of time for questions but it's here if you want to look at it on the website quality skills and experience that you need I'll just put these up oh, it's gone um, actually for doing the interviews you need good social skills and I've listed what some of these are uh, and you can read these and think about these listening is absolutely the key one I think and it's really hard to do it's re when you first start doing this kind of interview you've got so much on your mind it's really hard to listen as well especially if you're recording it and you think well it's alright it'll be on the, on, the, on the recording but you really need to listen so that you can because what you do is analyse on the spot really you listen and you think analytically about what someone says and then you follow it up with another question which links to what they've said and which helps to develop uh, data around the themes that you're interested in. It's absolutely crucial and you just need to practice, I think. Um, but all of those other things I'll just leave there for you to look at. Um, and then for writing and, and presentation, analysis writing and presentation, I think you need these kinds of skills. You need to be very organised and systematic but you do need creativity, insight and imagination and you need to hold those things in balance. So it's no good just being creative if actually you've sort of made it up. <laughs> and it's no, be, it's no good being so systematic that you stamp out all possible creativity in how you interpret your data. You need a balance between these things. And you need to be ready and to show that you've done this, to test your own assumptions, to look not only for substantiation of what you, what you think you're saying, but also refutation. And you need to show you've done that because you don't have a statistical test to rely upon. And you don't have um, the, the robustness of the idea of standardised data behind you. So you have to find other ways to show that. And that is the end. Sorry? Can you just please repeat it again? Yeah. It's substantial. It's not enough to... It's not enough to... Yeah, it's important to check and test your own assumptions. So it's not enough... For example, if you think you've worked out what's going on and you've got a bit of a theory about this and so on... Well, it would be very easy to pick data which supported that and to write that in and say, look, here it is. This is very convincing. This is, this is my argument. But it's important that you look for data that would actually refute your argument as well, data that would run counter to what you think. So you need to do that for yourself in how you <laughs> analyse your data. But also when you write it up and disseminate it, because you can't say, well, I tested this using this significance test or whatever, you know, you need to show instead that you did look. So you could say, I looked for data. I looked for data that would refute this. This is what I looked for, and I didn't find any. Or I did, but this is how I explain this. And that strengthens your argument. Yeah. Okay. And that's the end. Okay. Jennifer, thank you so much.